Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Neuro Talks. Today, we have the privilege of having Dr. Kevin Kellaway from St. Mary's University with us today. Welcome, Kevin, to uh, our Neuro Talk. Happy to be here. So, Kevin, um, you know, we got to know each other from his the people that he works with. So, we had Jen Dimoff, we had Mike Teed um, on Neuro Talks before, and um, really. Dr. Kellaway, he is um, the one who has published a ton on mental health training for managers. So I thought I really had to get Kevin on, on the live today. Um, I keep coming across his work when we talk about mental health and management. Yeah. Um, and he really is one of the top 2% of researchers worldwide based on citation counts. So really has published a ton in this field and really excited to, to have his insight um, on what's going on with mental health and management. So I'll just dive right in. Um, Kevin right. with uh, these questions here but you know we've been talking a lot in our lives about the critical role that managers play and we often get questions like okay well what, what can we do um, and I think that's where your expertise come in, comes in because you love interventions <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah I, I was wondering if you could first give us maybe an overview of what sorts of interventions are available for managers so say there's a manager in a company who's struggling where can they go Sure. I, I think there's a, a, a couple of thing, types of things we, we do for managers uh, and, and again, probably should do more of because I've always said our, our, our model of leadership in North America is, is largely leadership in your spare time. Uh, so we, I think we, it's amazing. We spend a lot on leadership development, but at the same time tend to underinvest in managers mm -hmm. and uh, getting them their uh, you know, skilled up in the things they need to do. Um, so there's certainly training in uh, mental health awareness. We have the mental health awareness training program. Um, there are other programs much like it. These are all mental health literacy programs and they're designed to teach people sort of the basics of mental health. What are the major disorders people experience? What are the major types of problems? Um, and what do that they look like? Uh, and to a large extent, normalizing that, because if you look at the statistics, you know, we often cite the one in four uh, have will have a, a mental health problem. Um, and if you take statistics like that, uh, I always like to translate that because very personally, that means every one of us, it's a, it's either us that's struggling or it's somebody in our immediate circle is is struggling with a mental health issue. And that's everybody. So this notion that mental health is something that we don't talk about is a very strange thing, right? Because we all experience it. We've all witnessed it. You know, we've all been there. Uh, so we, the mental health awareness is designed to foster that, that sense of literacy. Um, and then there, I think there, there is specific sort of skill training for, for managers and leaders in organizations, some of which is directed at just being a better leader. Uh, because we know that leaders have an effect on employees' mental health. Uh, a colleague of mine has said, uh, "Anyone, this doesn't come as a surprise to anyone who's ever held a job. <laughs> right? <laughs> we know that the way our boss treats us has an effect yeah. on our mental health. Um, and then there, there is more focused sort of skill development. So we were talking briefly before, and I mentioned our right, right. leadership training, which is focused on uh, leading a, a a psychologically healthy workplace. Uh, we have a model called safer leadership that's focused on more physical safety in the workplace, uh, but it's, it's sort of focusing those leadership abilities um, on very targeted sort of areas. Mm -hmm. And in the companies that you work with, how commonly do you see these interventions actually being employed um do, when you go into a company do you do you notice that their managers have these sorts of trainings or is it not very common uh a mixed bag right now i think uh there's probably more people than ever have been through some form of uh, mental health literacy whether that's mental health first aid or the working mind or roads to mental readiness or or any of the programs out there that exist um so i think that you know there's there's more people doing that. There's yeah. less clear evidence that that's having a big effect. So those programs are all designed to increase awareness, but awareness is just that. Mm. It's just 
okay, I'm aware of this now. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily tell you what to do about it or how to intervene to help somebody or where you can seek help or, or any of those very practical matters. Mm -hmm. So what do you say that companies are moving away from, say, the basic mental health awareness training and desiring more specific, practical, actionable? I think we're just at that point where that's where we're, what we're starting to see is okay. I think companies have invested uh, fairly widely in awareness training. And uh, I, d I don't want to be too harsh on companies, but um, this is the, the sort of lowest, the easiest thing they can do, yeah. right? Is we can get everybody in, in a room for half, for half a day and talk about mental health. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with doing that but it doesn't exert any real change in the organization. Mm -hmm. And I think now companies have done that. And I know personally, as I talk to companies, they are more interested in going beyond that now and looking at, well, what are, what are the, the, the very specific skills and competencies that, that managers need mm. uh, to deal with these kinds of issues? Right. Yeah, and it makes sense too that, you know, you don't just develop a skill from a one-off half an hour workshop or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Sort of yeah you, I mean, you, you get some very useful information. And if you're not familiar with, uh, you know, the, the major things people experience, I, I always, I, I didn't originate this. I always refer to the SAD. Uh, it's, it's substance abuse, anxiety, and depression mm -hmm. uh, are probably, you know, among the most common in the workplace, we might add burnout to that. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's really, we teach people about what that is and what it looks like and what are the prevalence rates. And, and when people are experiencing uh, one of those issues, how do they show up at work? Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? Um, how might it affect their work behavior uh, or their behavior in the workplace? And you know what, what you as a manager or supervisor might see. Um, mm -hmm. So all that great stuff, um, but I know you've talked to to uh, Jen Dimoff, and uh, in when we developed this original training, she always described the workshop as having two parts: what do you know, and where do you go. Mm -hmm. So the the what do you know is what what do these mental health issues look like, and then where do you go? Uh, I think is the tougher part that we don't often get in generic training. Um, because that's what does a manager do? Right. So if an, if an employee comes to them with a problem or they notice an employee is, is exhibiting some, some signs of struggling, um, you know, they're not getting the work done, they're missing a lot of time, um, the sort of classic things that might indicate a problem. Mm -hmm. and then the question is, what does a manager do about that? And that's going to be partially dependent on what resources are made available through the company. Do you have an EAP? Do you have short-term disability programs, long-term disability programs, yeah. all those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, managers sometimes need some help and some guidance uh, on, on how to initiate that conversation with the employee and what the limits are. Because, you know, our experience is managers and organizations do not want to be counselors. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear the, the story of your life or the deep details of whatever you're struggling with. Um, and, and nor should they, and nor should an employee have to disclose any of that. Um, but I think it's perfectly appropriate for, for a manager or leader in an organization to say, look, this is what I've seen. It looks to me like you're struggling. Do you know we have these resources available? Yeah. And, and I know you wrote a whole paper on managers as resource facilitators, and I think that's a, a big that's exactly component it. that we play. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the times, you know, uh, the first thing, one of the first things we say in that paper is, you know, people often don't seek the resources they need when they're struggling. Now, some of that is stigma. Some of that, frankly, is we don't even realize we're struggling. Yeah, we think we're holding it together, right? And it sometimes takes somebody outside of ourselves uh, to to point out to us that we're not doing as well as we think. I, I always say I know when I'm stressed because my wife tells me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she is the one who will notice that I'm unusually cranky or yeah. I am usually distracted or, or whatever. Uh, and she can point that out to me and, and that can get me thinking about, you know, 
maybe maybe I am really stressed. I better take a look at this. Um, but if I don't even recognize it myself, I'm certainly, you know, we just don't wake up on Tuesday and say, I think I'll call the EAP program. Mm -hmm. We have to recognize that that we have a need to, yeah, to start right. seeking those resources. Right. And that, I think that's exactly right, that managers can fill that role. Um, yep. and, and we had, uh, so last week, um, or last live, we had Dr. Tracy Brower. She talked um, about how managers actually have the inordinate impact. She said that, you know, equal to the impact of their yep. partner, their therapist, doctor, in a survey that was done. Um, and so her question for you was, um, in looking at interventions, how can we make sure that the interventions are actually empowering for managers? Because it can also yep. lead managers to feel like, Oh my goodness! This I, I, I'm overwhelmed now. You know, I have all these things I have to do. Um, I have this huge impact on my employees. So, what is it about an intervention that you think could make it empowering or actually like exciting for a manager versus disempowering? I I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one is to uh, draw some fairly clear boundaries about what we're asking managers to do. Right, and again, that's. Uh, some of the earlier programs, I think, got into asking managers to do too much. Yeah. So we send them away for a couple of days and we teach them, um, you know, empathic listening and communication skills. And we're teaching them counseling 101. Uh, and that may not be what they need uh, or, or want. So I think we have to draw some boundaries around that. Um, I think the other thing for managers is in, in our work, we've always pointed out that um, this, you know, helping employees deal with mental health issues, this is not something extra. This is part of your job mm -hmm. because the way those problems show up at work is often related to workplace performance or workplace behavior. Even if it's not caused by the workplace, it could be that your, your marriage is breaking up or all kinds of things in your personal life. But when you come to work and the manager notices that you're you know, you're coming in late, you're leaving early, you're not really focused, you're not getting the, the job done. Managers have a, have a right and, and, and some would say an obligation to speak to you about that. And what we've done for the last hundred years or so is we've treated those issues as performance problems. So when I, as the manager, approach you, I approach you in that sort of disciplinary mindset that you need to straighten out right mm -hmm. and maybe a better approach is to say uh what we suggest to managers is, is there's a better approach to deal with that that doesn't take any more effort or or work on your part uh but you still have the conversation with employees you just point out look if you're struggling here's a whole list of resources that mm -hmm. that are available to you and maybe you should look into them yeah so really emphasizing the role of the managers as directing them to resources, not having to counsel them through right. um, <laughs> a huge, uh, you know, crisis. Um, I think. Right, because if you're asking managers to do something that they find deeply uncomfortable or deeply distasteful or that they disagree with doing, they are not going to do it. Yeah, yeah. Right, so you have to give them something doable mm -hmm. uh, that they, they can do within the confines of their own job and their own experience and, right. and things like that. And if you do that, then I think managers will be more willing to, yeah. to get involved. Right. Leads me on to my next question, which is, how do you see the field of mental health training for managers evolving over the next, say, like 10 years? What, what are gaps do you think that we need to be focusing on and, and, and filling? Yeah, I sort of touched on that earlier. I, I think the biggest thing that's going to happen and, and is already happening is I notice now when, when I talk to organizations or, or they call me or something like that, we're no longer talking about awareness. They want um, very specific training for managers, okay. right? And, and they want a more competency-based approach. So what are the competencies required of leaders to, to, to equip them to deal with employees with, with, uh, who are struggling with mental health issues. And that's a very different conversation, right? Because that's not throw everybody in the room and we show them a video and um, we have a talking head for half an hour or something like that. Uh, but that that requires, I think, more, more focused training, more in-depth training. And I think that's the, the route we're going down is it's going to start with more detailed uh, competency-based approach for, for leaders. Um, 
but I think we're going to extend that through the workplace too. There's a whole lot of issues we we need to deal with. Um, we mentioned in, in our review article and, and we mentioned in, in some, um, I, th I think every time I talk about this, I mention it, uh, we still don't know a whole lot about how do we help people who are struggling with uh, mental health issues stay in the workplace. Mm. And we, we frame that as accommodation and I increasingly don't like that language. I think accessibility might be a better approach, um, but it is how, how, how do we help people what is it we, we you know, uh, especially we learned during the pandemic, we can do amazing things about changing the workplace mm -hmm. and being uh, a lot more flexible and still get the work done. Um, yeah. And so I think things along those lines are going to become more of our, our sort of everyday approach to dealing with, with employees who are struggling. Right. So training managers for with specific competencies in order to create a workplace culture where... Yeah. Yeah, and, and then managers have a role in that in, in negotiating uh, those sort of accommodations or arrangements, right? And if, we, if we're going to say to somebody, okay, well, let's have you work at home, um, if that'll make it easier, then there's typically got to be some guidelines around that so that it's, it's a sustainable solution. Right. So um, I think we're getting much more targeted, yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, that's great. Right. Training approaches in our workplace yeah. arrangements. Right, and I know that in terms of developing interventions, that's something that you are also working on in terms of the right leadership model. And, um, I'm sure yeah, you yeah. Know. yeah, yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> my, my, you know, I always say my basic approach to, to studying leadership is what do I do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Right, because I think that's what leaders need to know is that they don't really need abstract theory. They need to know what do I do about this, yeah, yeah. and how do I handle th this type of situation. And that's always been my focus: is, is sort of very mm -hmm. pragmatically what what can we what can we learn from the research literature? Because I think it has to be evidence based. Uh, but what does the evidence tell us about what managers can actually uh, do? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, on that note, before we end our live, um, we always ask our speaker to pose a question to the next guest. Uh, so she's Nicole Abby Esber from Harvard Business School, and she looks at natural language processing to study conversational dynamics in teams, to study how leaders, what they can actually do. So, you know, on that note of actionable yeah. steps. What can leaders do to promote um, psychological safety in teams? So, um, yeah, what question would you would you pose to to her? Yeah, that, well, that's that again is where I get really pragmatic, and I, what I'd like to hear is what are the the three best things managers can do to create that climate of psychological safety? Because I think that I think that's super important in teams. Yeah. Uh, and we're recognizing now just how important psychological safety is, and the leader definitely has a role in creating that. Mm. So I'd like to hear her her top three. <laughs> uh, Great. Yeah. Great. We'll make sure to, to, to ask her that. Okay. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Sure. Calloway, um, for your 15 minutes of short little insights um, <laughs> advice from you. Um, there's a wealth of research um, that uh, our listeners can obviously access um, from Dr. Callaway's work. So feel free to check that out. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing what you will be doing in terms of all your interventions and how you're changing up um, mental health training for managers. So thank you so much again for joining us, Kevin. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, be in touch. Okay.